Welcome to Fixing South Sudan Show, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Madingor. Ten states, three administrative areas, one nation, one people. This week on Fixing South Sudan. We are at the University of Juba to China's spotlight on its journey as the oldest and largest public institution of higher learning in the Republic of South Sudan. The University of Juba was founded in 1975 by the then administration of High Executive Council for Southern Sudan to meet the demands of higher education at the time. 1977, the University of Juba began to admit its first students for the school year. In 2006, the university temporarily relocated to Khartoum and was brought back following independence in 2011. At its founding, the University of Juba adopted the motto of excellence and relevance. In recent times, the incumbent administration adopted its new battle cry, inventing the future, transforming society. How much has changed since the university was founded 42 years ago? Is it headed on the right path of fixing South Sudan? Joining us to speak about transformation at the University of Juba is its vice chancellor, Professor John Apuruat Akech. Professor John Akech was appointed Vice Chancellor in March 2014. He sits down with us for a candid conversation about the University of Juba. My pleasure to welcome Professor John Apuruat Akech back to this show and to talk about this very institution. Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you for welcoming me. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So we have a lot to talk about. University of Juba, as I said, is the oldest and the largest public institution of higher learning in the Republic of South Sudan. You came in in 2014. Tell me the shape in which you found the university and what is the progress over time. We can take it in doses. Welcome. Uh, thank you. I think to tell the story but how University of Juba has moved uh, in the last seven years uh, is going to take us a long time. All I have to say is that uh, we made progress on several fronts. One was the staffing uh, was far below what it was in 2011 when uh, South Sudan declared independence. There were less than 300 academic staff. Today, we have close to 900 academic staff which is the highest number they ever had. When uh, we got our independence, there were 700. Uh, we are 200 more than what it was. And also we expanded the number of programs, uh, both the undergraduate programs and the postgraduate programs. Um, and also, this is on academic uh, front and staffing front. On physical infrastructure uh, front, we have been able to maintain so many spaces and for the first time to have a paved um, uh, compound, uh, we have been trying to do that. So uh, we, uh, we try to also improve in administrative structures. We brought in uh, new directorates. Instead of talking about personnel unit or financial unit, we have now director of finance, procurement, engineering, um, uh, you name it. You came in and you were faced with a C or confronted with a sea of challenges, what would you say were the saving grace? Uh, you saw constraints left and right. What kept you going? Uh, well, it's a clear vision. One of the things that we did was, uh, as you announced earlier, the University of Europe was to build uh, trained civil servants for the then autonomous government of South Sudan. Now, we are an independent country. So the context has actually changed dramatically. 
and we have to rise up to that challenge. Now, there was never been a written vision about the university. Although the motto was excellent relevance, there was no vision about, you know, there was unwritten, you know, uh, mission. But we set ourselves a mission, a new mission, that we want to empower nations. We are committed to national economic empowerment, social transformation through education, research, uh, entrepreneurship, and service to community. And uh, we set ourselves the strategic goals, and you know, we set a roadmap for our work. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing, it actually, my appointment meant we have to enact some change, some transformation. Change is not easy. And so uh, you will get uh, resistance because um, so many people will be comfortable with what they have. And if you take it from them, uh, and they do not know what you are going to replace it with, that's the point of conflict. Was there resistance? Sure. Uh, there had been, uh, we had fights with the uh, Academic Staff Association, uh, which was basically a welfare association, it was not even a trade union. But uh, it appeared that they had, uh, uh, some of them had political agenda, but it's actually a resistance to change, taking different phase. Um, so we had to fight it out, um, and uh, eventually we were able to negotiate our way out of that conflict. Uh, we also had a uh, fight with the students. The students believe that this is a public institution to which they do not have to make any contribution. Uh, so uh, we tried them to make, ask to persuade them to make contributions so that we can operate uh, the university from their own contribution in form of fees. Uh, the fees, we had to adjust the fees to inflation. In fact, the fees were not raised. They were adjusted so that we can actually retain some of the special power, but they look at it as that. And we had conflict, uh, several conflicts over, uh, since 2017 and until last year, but I think we also were able to reach some understanding. You came in and change is driven by the leaders and let's talk about your leadership style, let's talk about your philosophy. Uh, part of that uh, was the change of the motto uh, from relevance, excellence and relevance to being able to meet the challenges of a globalized world. That was in part driven by you and you put it forward to the Senate. Uh, tell me why that change was necessary and was that part of your vision or is it realizing that we live in a different world from 1970s? Well, uh, I have said earlier that the context has changed. Uh, university of Yuba now is a flagship university. And uh, for the whole world, uh, they know that universities are the arm of the state. They are actually partners to state. They generate uh, the professional skills uh, by the people they train and they graduate. They do research that inform policy. Uh, they also provide services to the communities in which they are situated. So it has to come that way. We have to understand and reflect on what vision that we need to, to take. What is our role? I know that several universities also are there. There are five public universities. But we have, um, we have a position, we have a role, we have responsibility. So we have to come up with a vision. With vision, I mean with the mission come the vision. And with vision come the strategic goals. But also you need to think about the core values that will actually underpin your striving change. So we came with uh, core values. And then you have to have a battle cry, as you said, a motto that captured that. Now, this motto is not only about the University of Yuba, it's about South Sudan. And I, as a leader of that change, then I have to do a lot of work and uh, reflect and share that idea. So the motto was born out of that. Uh, my own reflection, my colleague reflection and echoes of- You made you the know, argument and it was adopted and, and by the And then it was adopted. Now, why did we call it inventing the future transforming society? Um, I, I was in my study uh, one time and I came as, across um, a statement by one of uh, professors, a US professor who said the best way to actually uh, to create the future that you want is to invent it. And I said, okay, from this idea, I actually said, okay, we invent the future, 
We do the things that will actually create the future. Like Gandhi has said, Gandhi said the future begins now. And Gandhi also said that, you know, what you do at the present will actually impact the future. That's the original idea. So what the University of Yuba needs to do is to drive towards its vision, but the, the vision is aligned to the needs of the country. And so for us, not only the University of Yuba, for us, the South Sudanese, the best way to create the future we want is to invent it. Let me pick up from that because a vision can be beautiful, but achieving it is another ball game. In the 70s, the needs of the time were training the civil servants. That means the university had a focus. Now you're talking about everything and nothing. So where do you start? Are you not going to get lost in the woods? Yes, beautiful song, inventing the future. Is it about inventing it or is it about accepting that there is an existing future that you must work towards? It's not about creating one. Well, you can sing the song as long as you want, if that's what you want to do. Uh, but the slogans alone will not work. You have to uh, do the talk and do the work. Now, what, is your, is. what is the work that you are doing? Where is the focus? I'm coming there. Where is the focus? You said university is about meeting existing challenges. Yeah. Where are the priorities okay. of the government and are you meeting them? Now, when we move from journalism, we talk about management. Management is a different thing. Management is about, you know, how do you achieve your goals? It's about a strategy. So from vision, you know, as a manager, you have to have a strategy. And a strategy, you have a strategic objectives. When you achieve them, then you know that you have achieved. So we have 11 strategic goals. They are long for 15 years, 2030. We have vision 2030, which means we need to get there. So we said the first strategic goal is to expand the quality of higher education. I mean to, uh, to, to actually improve the quality, access to quality higher education. What does it mean? University of Yuba need to reach out more, to more students, to more spaces in South Sudan. Also to come up with new programs. Uh, we also have another strategy called internationalization. How do we do that? Uh, we also have service community. We also have to help. Those one, 11 strategy goal has an implementation matrix, which means under, you know, when you say, I want to improve access to quality higher education, what do you mean? For us, we also have actions. The action means more programs, more colleges, uh, uh, increase in number of students, increase in number of staff, also having community colleges in the states, and we have started moving along that line. Professor, let me get you to address the basic principle of an education or a higher education for that matter. It is to solve the problems of the society. And picking up from the point that I just made, where is the focus? We know we are a new nation. We are faced with a set of challenges. What is the university, the university education that you are offering able to meet at this point? Where okay, is the focus? all right. Now you need, you know, the university in the first most education to graduate people with professional skills in law, in medicine, in business, in ICT, in engineering, and in humanities, arts, and music and drama. Those are the people that needs, the society needs to actually do. Even if we have resources, we need human resources to transform those resources into prosperity. So like any other universities, whether it be Harvard, Oxford, Cape Town, Cairo, Makarere, it's actually that the first number one. The other one is actually do research. Uh, research that will inform policy, uh, as I said. So in terms of human um, actually having enough people, we actually moved from, when I came, there was about 10,000 students. Today we have 23,000 students. I understand, but what is the impact, what is the impact of the University of Juba on the Let society? Would you say there is a positive correlation between the education that you're offering and what the society is getting. You don't measure it directly like that. You don't measure it directly like that. Whereas it, in the context okay. of the 70s, it, it. the regional government had a focus on relevance. The education at the time was relevant to the needs of the time. What about now? Is it about being everywhere and nowhere? I think we are somewhere. 
because I have told you that we have increased our programs. We have been graduating to the last average of three to 2,000 a year. Now, if you go to the airport here, okay, and you find somebody serving at a desk, you know, they will tell you that, sir, I'm, you know, I'm either graduate of university, or sir, I'm actually enrolled in MBA program, or I'm doing public policy. Uh, if you come, if you come here in the afternoons, you find this is like a car park. And those ones who are there, they're all from the ministries. They're all from all sectors. They're from these hotels. What are they doing here? They're looking for the skills for them to be effective. That is how we see ourselves contributing to society. And let me put it uh, the other way. Uh, the University of Juba, when people hear it, the public hear it, uh, what, what is the perception? What is the perception about the university? Do you say that the perception is changing? Uh, before, it was seen to be of no value. Has that turned around, and why? Universities will always have values. Uh, what society would want to see is that uh, for them to do more and to rise to their expectations. So uh, University of Juba has always contributed. A lot of leaders now actually who are in the government are uh, you know, graduate University in of Juba. In terms of the brand, would you say the brand is now much more prestigious than before? It's not for me to say, but I will only give you an indirect answer. Um, an indirect answer is that um, there is stability at University of Juba. We, you know, we have, although sometimes you can hear banks and cries, you, we settle it in a few days and you find learning is going on. For us, uh, this is good name. There was a time that a student medicine will spend an average of nine years. The, uh, the student who has a four years program actually finished seven years because of closures, because of, we have been able to overcome problems. You have brought stability to the university. It means confidence of the students to enroll at the University of Juba. Actually, let me say a few good things that you have done. Uh, when I was moving around the university, I saw a lot of physical infrastructural change that is happening. Uh, we see the landscape, we see the new gates, we see a lot of physical changes. And that is something you brought. How did you achieve that? Well, this is what, um, it is important also really not to blow your own whistle. It's very important for, uh, for the action to speak for themselves, you know. So it's not for me to say, uh, but I have to say that the perce perception has improved from the feedback that we get. Uh, three years into uh, my program in 2017, we actually we did an assessment of public perception. We didn't just take it like that. We interviewed 200 people. Uh, across the sectors, from students to staff to the public sector. And what they, we got was actually good. And even now, uh, we have not done another study. However, the feedback in an informal way I get is a positive. That is a kind of progress. Uh, so I think it's to, for the people to say that. It's not for me. But what we need for us is to achieve our goals. We said that you know we want to go from A to B. Once we get there, we are happy, and then you know everybody will talk for themselves. When a visitor comes into the university, uh, both campuses, what they see is appealing on the outside. What about the inside? How does your kitchen look like? Yes, I think it's, um, uh, there will always be something to do. Always uh, something to do. We have challenges. Uh, we have an ailing infrastructure. That has not, there has not been any investment in infrastructure. Uh, and the student, what the student pay uh, is not really enough for us uh, to do everything. We have big dreams to create, to build laboratories, to build washrooms, uh, to build student spaces, to build better lectures. But we are constrained by resources. I always say that, uh, uh, that a vice chancellor, especially in the context, an African context, and more so, in South Sudan and maybe neighboring countries. A vice chancellor is seen like a single mother. You know, a single mother, the dad actually uh, is absent. And I mean here, uh, you are given kids. You know, families, 
people in the government, they expect the university to function. We are given children to look after, to educate. However, we are less supported, you know, in terms of laboratories, in terms of lecture halls. Universities are always say, are beautiful spaces. Actually, they are more beautiful than the government offices uh, because these are learning institutions. Uh, but what we do now, we try to do our best, really. Uh, so what I'm saying here... Made progress on yeah, the renovation, so when you say but on the inside, the toilets, yeah, yes. the accommodation, yeah, there there's a lot that is not there. Not only that, the toilets are there, but the toilets have been closed down. <laughs> the clothes, you know, if you find that it's over 280, students talk about toilets, the toilets have been closed. Why? Because we don't have the infrastructure, you know, the, the toilets, the, the septic tanks, you need to empty them, you need to look after them. Uh, the town, the city has no running water uh, and so many things beyond the university. So we are trying to improve on that, uh, to, uh, to reopen some of these toilets so that the students access them. But foremost, we need lecture halls for them, we need the laboratories and then next washroom. And as I said, to your credit, there is a movement on the physical infrastructural uh, front. But you are just playing catch up. You are just renovating the existing, no expansion. Yes, it's very difficult. The prices of making things in Juba is extremely, extremely expensive. Uh, so the money that the students actually uh, give us is not enough to build you know, uh, more lecture halls. If you see here, we found uh, you know, neglected spaces. Some of them were stores. We turned the stores into lecture halls because you have the wall already there. So all you need to do is that improve on that wall and put air condition, put lightning, and then create desks. Uh, we also turn some spaces into, uh, uh, into, the, into laboratories again. Uh, again, you actually have something there on which you build. Uh, do not forget also, the best way to actually rise up to the sky is to start from the ground. You cannot really start without, in a, you think that you have new, new buildings without actually uh, maintaining the old one. So we start with Samani Hall. Uh, if you have seen the Samani Hall. You are doing a great job of maintenance. Expansion is a function of resources. That's right. But if you not that money. the vision is not there. The vision is there, but the resources are not there. They are limited. Why so don't we talk about the resources? They are finite and you talk about the money that the students give you. And in another words, in another way, it is called tuition fee. And it has been quite a struggle. Some people say that you uh, wage a major battle, a crackdown on the students' populations for you to arrive at some modest development that we are seeing. Uh, what is the genius of the idea? You try to adjust the existing rates then the inflation over time has eroded uh, the, the, the money, the value of the money that the students were paying. Just a bit of background about that. Okay, I just to give you an example. In university, we need to buy paper uh, the, to print things out, room for the copying, and so on. We need to maintain uh, broken uh, power you know, uh, generators. Uh, we need to buy water for our guests. Now, when I came in here, a bottle of water, still water, was about one pound. Today, it's 150. At the same time, the student of medicine was paying 2,000. Now, the increase of water is actually more than 600, you know, like uh, uh, 3,000 times the inflation. The student's fees at that time was actually worth more. Like student medicine at official price was um, getting something paid like 600. The value had declined. The value of the currency had declined and that necessitated the change. Yeah. What was the change? The change is that we have to adjust the value, the, the figure. The figure, for example, if you were paying uh, 2,000, the medical students now, uh, we are asking them to pay like 50, 50,000 or 60,000 for medical students. The student law are paying about 40,000. Uh, and then the, the SSP. normal SSP. And then you have the social science, like education, community studies, about 30,000. Plus registration, uh, what we call functional fees on top of that. So I, I say for uh, community studies, when you add the functional fees, it comes to around 42,000.
thousand a year. Now you break that one into into is around twenty thousand a semester. But they were complaining about How that. How much per dollar term per student? It's very little. Now before that it was a lot, but this year it's not. For if if you if you are paying forty thousand this year, how much is it? It's less than hundred dollars. And uh, at first you attempted the policy and it was cancelled by the government. Yes, uh, the student campaign they influenced the you know our political decision makers, and it was seen that it was unnecessary and it may actually cause uh, problems in universities. And so uh, the president decided to cancel the first one. However. You insisted, you we did insisted. not relent, and, and what was your basic argument for insisting? Well, I told the president when I was given the second term, I said, in the first we tried, because we were blind. And when we were blind in 2016, we suffered to the extent that everybody who was, have access to media have heard that. We have to ask the students to pay money so that we can print examination script. That was how bad it was. Now, when I was given the second term in 2019, and uh, we were invited to meet the president or the vice chancellor. The president wanted to know uh, what are the banning issues. So I was one of the people who told the president, look. You argued successfully yeah. and you began to enforce it. Let's talk about some of the tactics that you use to arrive at your goals. Some of them dra draconian, according to uh, your critics. Uh, of course, you deregistered some students, you banned some students, and you did everything to arrive at your goals. Are some of them regrettable? Some students have been banned from the university because of association with the resistance that happened or with some of the protests that happened. Do you regret some of the tactics? Maybe there are unintended consequences. I don't think there was any major tactics apart from making sure that there is law and order at the university. Uh, first of all, we have tuition fees, which we uh, initially, the one that was established in March 2019, and uh, students actually protested. So we sat down with students, their bodies, uh, what you call college associations, and they agreed to, uh, to a reduction, a compromise fees. So we had a compromise fees. Now, but from the compromise fees, there was what you call passive resistance. Some students were not paying. They were no longer uh, lobbying against it, but they were not paying. The specific question yeah. that I asked was whether you regret I'm doing, I'm doing any of your actions. Well, it's a yes or no question. I don't think everything in life is about yes or no. Uh, it is very important to explain the background. The background is that I won't tell you the genesis very quickly. What you no, wanted to effect was public interest, we understand. Well, but the tactics, do you regret some of those there tactics? There is no really tactics there. What we did was to make sure that you are a student at the University of Yuba. The only condition you clear your fees. We offered you the opportunity. We used to give them, you know, infinite number of installments. So you can give any number of installments. But we stopped that. We decided to have two installments for the whole year. I understand so, the argument so for the money. You used the police on the students. Some were arrested. Some were kicked out. There was violence. Uh, Is that something you have? You, yes. you regret? Well, I don't regret it because... It was justified. Police were not even there. Police were not there. It was the students who started the violence. And i tell you how. 26th of October... It was justified. The actions were justified. Of course, you need to maintain order. The vice chancellor actually in our constitution, I have the responsibility to make sure that there is stability. And let me point this thing out. It turned out that most of the students are ready to make their own contribution. But there were a few political activists who actually believe that this is a public, as a matter of principle. Let me tell you, some of the students that we uh, dismissed or suspended, they have paid. But they wanted to be in solidarity with those who are unable to pay. That is the core of the argument. Some of them complained to me that they were not even a party to whatever that went on. So indeed, there was always a sample that slipped into uh, punishment. Well, it's not, of course, you have 23,000 students, of which 14 of them were actually dismissed, and then uh, about 14 of them. So you are talking about 28. This is a small minority. Now, if your name is able to come up, this is not a rocket science. The students themselves, they know the troublemakers, 
And so they voluntarily gave the information out. Some of them were able to investigate them. And in fact, by the way, the violence, those who have been 28, that is not only one action. You remember in, uh, in January 22nd, uh, there was violence here when the students were told that if you have not cleared your fees, you shouldn't take exams. An engineering student protested here on this campus and they broke things. And this was in social media, everyone saw that. Now, so those were dismissed, and then there was this uh, violence in October uh, 2020. So when we actually uh, dismissed students, some of them, actually majority of them were the names given in January. Some were caught on the video uh, and so on. So this measure is not regrettable because it is necessary. You speak as if you are flawless as a leader. Are you saying that you never made any mistakes in the whole process? You don't call this mistake. Or you don't know the mistakes that you no, made. You don't call this one mistake. You know, I may have my other mistake, but you don't call this mistake. Enforcing... You call them justified. Yes. This is a mandate. This is a responsibility. And the result is that the students, majority of them, they know that they have to make contribution to their education. They oblige, and only a few. So what, what you need to do, you need to actually penalize very few in order to save you know, the majority. I know that you are a results-oriented kind of guy, and you get credit for that. But at the same time, the personality, people have gone very far even to describe you. They call you an authoritarian, a dictator, and the most interesting one, that you are an angry small god. What do you make about that? Uh, I think that is exaggeration. Uh, it it's not exaggeration. I'm stating the facts about what people call yes, you. Yeah, you can know, respond I've to that. I had that. I'm, I never had anybody call I me read in my it face. This morning. Well, you show me. But uh, what I know is that, uh, you know what? Leadership, you must have, have a strong sense of direction. Uh, the other thing is that you don't go alone. Now, if you see what, what, um, what is happening in the University of Yuba here, it's not because the vice chancellor is dictating. It's because I select the right people in the right place. I put the team up. I have different levels, the senior management. I have the dean's board. I have the senate. All the problems, all the new ideas are actually discussed. It's institutional. And the, and the solutions come there. Creative solution. And in fact, the stability that has been created is not because of one clever man sitting at the top. It's because of a person who actually mobilized the team, the best brains. You are a man of an institution called the Senate which has been endorsing uh, some of your uh, initiatives. Uh, and I would like to bring this issue, which you wrote about beautifully, Acad academic freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of opinion. And yet, paradoxically, you are accused even by Human Rights Watch of being able to suspend some of the professors. I don't want to name them because of the very opinion that you wrote about. Yes, I think I also wrote about that a freedom, academic freedom, you know, when uh, a professor ventured into social issues, when university also is thrown into national matters, political matters. There is then, a limit to that. Yes, and then what will happen? You need neutrality. You need, you know, you need university. There is image that a professor shouldn't get you know, take sides in the conflict of the society. We have to tell them, give them the options, and we tell them why this is good. You are now elaborating your point, but in the student newspaper at Juba Varsity, you talked about freedom of thought without any limits. Now you are putting the limits, which is which? No, in university, actually, you, have to, you haven't reached the end. If you reach the end, there are examples when the professors, I, I wrote there that, Henry Kassinger went to go, was given a professorship at you know, Columbia University. And the administration of Columbia University uh, wanted you know, Kassinger to come because he was um, a, you know, a successful, uh, if you like, you know, uh, you know, Secretary of State for US and intellectual. But the students and the staff, they protested because of his role in uh, war in Vietnam and all that. So he was the opposed. So now, on the principle of academic freedom, uh, the administration was saying, you know, it is their business. But those professors and the senior were saying no. So you can see the controversy. So the that freedom thing. is not absolute. It is and not are absolute. You saying that there are some opinions that warrant punitive measures. Now, what happened is that if the society, if a professor 
come up with something that is divisive to the society, the very society. And you know, you are actually here representing everybody. If the society, if the professor become like, I belong to this group, they have been compromised. Again, they are, they are wrong and you are right. Is the Human Rights Watch wrong to call you out on such kind of tactics? Well, what we do, and it's not only Human Rights Watch, there's no absolute freedom anywhere, even where Human Rights Watch is based. Uh, these issues happen the same year that uh, a, a prominent professor was, uh, was um, actually uh, in, investigated and later on there was issue like that in Australia, uh, boarding ethnic issues and racism. There was something on the same issue uh, in uh, University of Leeds. There was one other thing in University of Maryland. So on the same year, land, when the American um, uh, ambassador came to me, I said, okay, look, this is the US. There is a limit. There is a limit. But also you have to judge when there is, there's a limit. So and sometimes the judgment could be personal. And for that reason... And in some cases, some people said you took law to your hands. I don't think so. That someone criticized you and was suspended and removed. From the Let me tell you this. Everything has its own uh, limit. Now, you as a leader, you as a leader... There is a limit. Again. I will check that. Yeah, I will not belabor that point. Yeah. We have come full circle, and we appreciate the discussion that we have had. University of Juba of the past, University of Juba of now. In this program, we speak of fixing South Sudan. As a leader of this institution for seven years, have you fixed the University of Juba? Or has it fixed you in the process? Um, I think we have made progress, as I'm saying. We think that our mission uh, is uh, national economic empowerment and social transformation. And we have set ourselves in strategic goals of expanding uh, uh, vertically and horizontally. I think we have expanded vertically in terms of postgraduate program. Now we move from six programs to about 45 programs as we speak today. Uh, we also increase the number of students which means the output to the society has increased from 10,000. We more than doubled that. Uh, we have improved the infrastructure uh, so that we have a very attractive environment. We haven't reached there. I'm saying it's progress. So seven years out of 15 years strategy, I think we are somewhere on track. And would you say the university has had an impact on you, has fixed you? Have you learned anything? I have learned from so much. From the instability. I, I have learned so much because it's not only that. What have you learned? You, you are battle hardened. You know what? What have you learned that is an, ing let, an let ingredient me, yeah. an ingredient for fixing okay, South Sudan? Let me tell you this. Problem solving. Problem solving. You know, there is no school for graduate for there is no school for graduating by chancellor. You learn on the job. The little you have and what you learn, you learn from your colleagues, you learn from the Dean's board, you know, from wisdom of different people. You learn to solve problems. You learn to be pragmatic. You know, because you learn to fight for the results. And Professor, so I'm, I'm afraid so much. we have to leave it there. Thanks for being on Fixing Thank you so South much. Sudan Show. Thank you Professor so John Cage, the Vice Chancellor, University of Juba. Thanks for coming to the show. Thank no, you. No, 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 this. <laughs>